Thank you for joining us again in Louise and Mally's Bible study. Uh, there were some questions that came to uh, us about the rapture of the church. I done a teaching on the rapture, and it seemed to be one of the better interest of a lot of people because we do live in the end times, and people are very curious and concerned about rapture and what it means and so forth and so on. So I want to go over it again, and I want to kind of clarify some things that have been questions that have been asked. Um, so I'm going to ask Mally to read first out of uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, I think it is. Yes. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful and unholy, without natural affection, truce, break, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. If, if nothing describes the times that we're living in, I don't know what does. And I know we've lived in perilous times in this country and, and, and previous uh, countries have, but these uh, prophecies, statements by Paul, really pretty much nails a lot that's going that's on. That's correct. Doesn't it, Mally? Yes, yes, yes it does. What, what one stands out to you the most? Well, the one that I pointed out, yeah. the one that says that despisers of those that are good, they just really... There was a prophecy, I think it was in Jeremiah or Isaiah, it may have been Isaiah, where it said, oh, what will be good will be bad, and what will be bad will be good, uh, that things will be turned upside down in the last days. And I think we're seeing a lot of that too. I heard one of the newscasters say, everything's turned upside down. I don't understand it. The things that we used to think were good are now bad and vice versa. And so that was exactly what um, Isaiah had said, prophesied right. and said was going to take place. Uh, so I want to just go through some of the facts. One of the things here that Paul says in uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, uh, he says uh, in verse 13, I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep. So let's just stop right there because there was a lot of uh, talk during the churches at this time that the rapture had already taken place and that this had already happened and people were very concerned. And Paul is telling them, I don't want you to be ignorant about what's going on right now. Uh, those who have fallen asleep are those who are believers. Now, I want to clarify that because the rapture does not pertain to unbelievers. It only pertains to the church. And if you're not in the church, you're not a believer, you're not a bride of Christ, then you're not going to be raptured. That's just the, the and, and there's no second guessing it, okay? Because it is going to happen in an instant. That's correct. And you're not gonna know when it's gonna happen. And so this is very important because people just twiddle their thumbs and twiddly d and twiddly da and me and me and my, and they think they have time and they don't think it applies to them, and it does. And uh, you're going to be left behind, and that's just the truth. And Paul says, I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep. Least you sorrow as others who have no hope. The no hope group are those that died in unbelief. They're the ones that never received Christ as their Lord and Savior. They are the ones that are not born again. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. 
For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive, mm -hmm. that's us, Paul was talking about himself at that time, and remain until the coming of the Lord. You see, the early church thought Jesus was coming back at any time then. And we were over, we're over 2,000 years since the death of Christ, and we're still anticipating his return. But he says, remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. So what's he saying here? That when the rapture takes place, those who have already gone to sleep, those believers who have passed on, and are asleep and have gone to sleep in the Lord, they will be risen first and they will put on a glorified body. Now, why do I say that? Because let me tell you, you're gonna get a new body. Why is that important? Because you're going to shed the sin nature. You see the outward shell of your body, the sin nature still abides. And that sin nature cannot go into the holiness of God. And so you're going to get a glorified body that will no longer have the sin nature in it. That's correct. And you will be set free from the, the, the tugging and the war that is constantly going on between your flesh Amen. and your spirit. That, one, that one definitely won't be anymore. No. That's right. It will be a wonderful freedom. And you will put on a glorified body without any spot or any wrinkle. So you, you are already righteous spiritually. You are already holy spiritually. But when you put on your glorified body, then the glory of the Lord shall just shine out from you. Because you will That's put right. on His glory. That's right. Amen? That's right. Yes. And it says here, uh, For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we by, uh, fall asleep, and we will not proceed. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Yes. That's the second time he's told us this. Mm -hmm. The dead in Christ will rise first. That's correct. The ones that have already passed on. Right. Correct. Now, this is not the second coming of Christ. This is the rapture we're talking this about. This is right the now. rapture. There's a difference. That why do I say that? Because he specifically says that he will come from heaven, will descend from heaven. He doesn't say he touches the earth. He will descend from heaven. And with a shout and the blow of a trumpet, we will rise up to meet him in the air. Yes. Right? Yes. But at the end of the tribulation, at the end of the tribulation, Jesus comes down to the earth. His feet touch the Mount of Olives. He splits the Mount of Olives in two. And with his word of his mouth, he defeats all the enemies right. against the, of the church. Okay. There will be believers during the time of the tribulation. Yes, because people have, have turned, have seen what, it, you know, they've seen the rapture, and then they, they, will, turn, they will turn and have an opportunity. Just because if you don't get raptured with the believers at that particular time, you'll have another opportunity. But you really don't want to have to go through the tribulation. No, you don't. You, you don't. really don't. You really don't. But the first three and a half years, the world's going to be in chaos, and the Antichrist will come forth. Do you see the church? We're the ones that hold back the Antichrist. It's That's the right. body of Christ that holds back the Antichrist. Prayers, yes. And the Antichrist is already here. I really believe he's already here. But he just hasn't made his appearance because the church is still here. Okay? But once the church is removed, he comes straight onto the scene. And Satan takes over as, as if, like, when Jesus came into the world, Satan makes his appearance into the world, and he 
and by, and binds himself in the Antichrist. The Antichrist is a type of Jesus. As Jesus was a type of the first Adam who came into the earth and took on the, the body of man, the Antichrist also takes on the body of Satan. He becomes Satan's child, so to speak, yes. son, yes. okay, that will operate in this earth for th for seven years. A long time. Yes. And so the things that are accumulating in the earth today, you know, everybody's talking um, about global warming and different things, and I'm not going to get onto political issues or anything like that, but I'm going to tell you that the Bible also says that the earth travails as in birth pangs for the coming of the Lord. You see, even nature wants to be set free from the curse that was put upon it at the time that Adam sinned. That's right. At the time of Adam's sin, there was a curse that was put on the whole earth, all of nature. And even nature knows and cries out. That's right. And so a lot of the rumblings and tumblings, somebody, oh, I know one of the other questions that was given to us, Mally, that we need to answer. But a lot of the stuff that's taking place is nature also kind of giving birth pains to, to the coming of the rapture of the church. And a lot of things are speeding up. And the fires, the floods, all these things, they're just happening much faster and a quicker pace, wars, wars, and rumors of wars. But Jesus came for one purpose in the world, and that was to, to defeat the devil, and he defeated the devil. Now that's the he, other question. He defeated the devil. That, that was, was the other question that was asked. Pur pur purpose. Mally, was, um, okay, the other question was, well, if God loves us and God cares for us, why do bad things happen to good people? Why do all these catastrophes take place? Why is there a plague? Why do good people who have been good people die? Why do these things happen if God is a loving God? Because it says Satan is actually the God of this world. But Jesus, when Jesus came, he, he, he put Satan under his feet, but not... Not everyone knows this, Louise. Not everybody doesn't know that, that Jesus, that they, that all power has been given to us. Okay, well, let's, let's go back to the very beginning and to the Garden of Eden. And in the Garden, all authority was given unto who? It's all given to Adam. Adam. He had all authority. And God told him, listen, you tend to everything. You tend to the Garden. All authority over the animals, everything, all the authority has been turned over to you, and you deal with it, okay? Yes. Now, Adam, for whatever reason, and I'm sure there's a lot of us that are going to be asking him this question, uh, <clears throat> knowing he was very, very smart, he was very smart, and with full knowledge, took the lease, it was as if he was given a piece of paper, and he took the lease that God had given to him, the full ownership of everything, and he turned it over to Satan and signed Satan's name onto it. And Satan became the God of this earth. Yes. And that's when sin entered in to man. Correct. Okay? So Jesus had to come in the form of a human being. He was 100% deity and he was 100% man. And he had to take the place of the first Adam. And you see, there is a legal side to God. There is a court in heaven and God does things in an orderly in a very legal, legal fashion. And so 
since Adam had turned the lease over to Satan, God just couldn't come along and snatch it out of his hands because God is a God of his word. And he had given that to Adam. Now, Adam betrayed God, but God had to come up with a plan to right. save us, right? Mm, yes. Because we're in a fix. We've That's been right. sold into prison, right? That's correct. We're in jail. And somebody had to come along and pay our bond. That's correct. And not just pay our bond, but somebody had to come along and do our time. That's right. Okay? That's right. Because we couldn't. And so uh, Jesus came along and he, at, he walked out exactly what the first Adam should have done. And when he was tempted, when Satan took him up after he received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, he went up on the mountain and he was tempted. He was tempted in all points, just like you and I. He was tempted just like Adam. Totally. That's right. Correct. But he passed the test. Yes. He conquered sin, hell, death, and the grave by, he by, by doing what God told him to do. He said at the end, he says, now this, my father has, you know, given me an assignment and I'm going to do what he told me to do. Mm -hmm. And I'm going, I'm going to do it because, because I love the father. I'm going to do what he told me to do. So what did he do? He he walked it out. He walked, he walked it out. But you know something? I think something a lot of people don't really understand. Jesus could have said no. He definitely could have said no. He, in the, in and the then, garden. And then he in, even asked the Father, is, is there any other way? Is there any, any other way? Is there any other way to do this that I can redeem mankind without having to go through all this pain and suffering and do what I have to do and to be humiliated and spit on and... You and, know, I, and, and I honestly, beaten Mally, and crucified, right. and he, because he knew exactly what it was going to put. He was going to have to go through, and he says, "And I am willing. I am willing to do it." Because he said, and that's why he kept telling them, "No greater man has loved than lay down his life for his for his brother." And he said, "And that's and that's what I'm doing for you. I'm laying down my life for you." You see, I don't think we can even begin to comprehend uh, the fullness of what took place on the cross. Absolutely not. It would be terrible to, <clears throat> but, to think about it. You know, it, the physical side of it was devastating, but the spiritual side of it was that Jesus had never been separated from the Father. That's correct. He and the Father, for all of from the there was no beginning. He had always been with the Father. That's right. And um, and so when he said, uh, you know, always he had referred to God as Father, 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 Father. That's right. But at the last, when the sin of all mankind was put upon him and he became dead spiritually because he took on the sin of man, he didn't say, Father, Father, why did you do this to me? He said, my God, my God, what, what am I going to do? Why have you forsaken me? And, and I think that what it is, is we got to realize that Jesus, even though he was, he was half God and half man. He was 100%. He was 100% God and 100% man. But he had, he suffered, suffered so. And it was, it was all of a sudden a, the feelings he felt like that he was he felt like it you know a lot of times how, how we feel he felt like that god had forsaken him but god really had not forsaken him but that was just a he was well he was actually to be feelings. honest Mally, god did turn his back on him because god well, he can't had look to, on he sin he had to for, for he had to for, until jesus for, had paid the full price season. the full penalty right. penalty but it was when he had gone to hell a short time and suffered the full penalty penalty God did turn his back on him. That's why he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And so that yes. was the, that, was that was the thing why. that was one of the hardest things that Jesus had to endure was the separation from his father who, who was no longer his father. And that's why mm -hmm. Jesus is referred to as the firstborn from the dead right. because he went to hell and he took all the punishment everything that should be yours and mine and he finally god said that's it that's enough it is it's it's done the price has been paid 
And at that point, Jesus conquered Satan, put his foot on his head, and took all of the captives with him. Right, and that that's had, when he got his resurrected body that you were talking about earlier, mm -hmm. that Jesus has right has, now has, has, has a resurrected body, the same type of body that we will be, we'll have a resurrected body also. But for the very first time, for the very first time, in all of eternity, for the very first time, a man is in heaven. A man. Jesus That's didn't correct. leave his body. He kept his human body. And the re well, we're going to go into a study about that at some other time when we talk about the um, blood covenant. But the 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 his hands and his side are always a reminder, always before God. That's of right. the price that he paid for you and me. That's correct. And so he we have a a man that is pleading our case always before the Father. Sitting at the right hand of God Almighty, yes. Yes. And so I want to give you we are going to if you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I'm gonna tell you something. You may be going through some tough times right now, but you can be assured that God is going to take care of you because he said, I will look after my own. Yes, I'll never leave you or forsake you. Amen. That's right. And so even though fear tries to grab people's hearts when they see this, if you know Jesus Christ, you have nothing to fear. That's correct. Because there is going to be a triumphant entry into the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ at the day of the rapture. Right. I'm going to give you a couple scriptures. Um, in uh, the rapture and the second coming are contrasted in Luke 21, 36 and Matthew 24, 29 through 30 and in Jude 14. Um, the rapture takes place before the tribulation. And there are a lot of people that say, well, uh, there's pre-trib, <laughs> mid-trib, and post-trib. So there's a lot of controversy as to when. But I'm going to take Paul at his word. I believe that God is going to take the bride of Christ out of here. We are not going to be judged in those seven years. The seven years are on the Jewish judgment. It goes back to the time period of the Jews, right at the moment that Jesus was crucified, and the Ten Nation Union, and all of those nations that were involved during the time that Jesus walked on this earth, it is like the clock stops and it goes back. And that's why you have the Ten Nation Union and all that. The, the United States is not going to be part of what takes place during the tribulation. We're, really, what you're seeing in the decrease of the United States, that's biblical. That's just biblical. Because the Ten Nation Union is going to rise up after the rapture and the the uh the antichrist is going to take charge of that ten nation union and that's where everything's going to take place and uh so we're going to avoid that time of the seven years of the judgment on the jews okay that is one thing that jesus does not like is fear it is the main tactic main mm -hmm tactic of the enemy is to put fear on you about having to go through the tribulation. You're not so, going to go through it. So, that, so you that said, the well, Lord, what's that, going to happen no, to me that's during right. that he time? Keeps he, keeps, he keeps talking about peace. Peace I leave with you. Mm -hmm. Peace. Peace. So you can't be at peace and have fear too. Hmm. So really what happened is it's good because it also said that we do need to know what goes on in Revelations, what goes on after the rapture. But really, it's not anything that we should be fear, no, fearful of. But we, did, we do need, always we need to be informed. Well, people say, well, well Louise, what happens, during, what happens to us during those seven years? While there's seven years of 
tribulation on the earth and the, the earth is turned upside down and everything's happening. What, what's happening with us? We are taken into what we call the, the reward seat of Christ. Some call it the judgment seat, but I call it the reward seat of Christ. And it's where you're going to stand before the Lord and you will receive your rewards for what you have done here on this earth in Jesus' name. Right. Okay? And, um, and then uh, you will be rewarded and you will be held accountable for every word that you have spoken, every idle word. But Jesus is going to look at you and I want you to hear me out. Because he has given every believer an assignment. Every believer has an assignment in the body of Christ. And we're going to talk more about that. And purpose. We're going to talk more about that at some other time. But we, every one of us, has a place in the body of Christ. And when you get born again, your job is to find out what's my place in the body, what's my assignment, and what do you want me to do? And you need to start growing up spiritually and then begin to operate in the gifts and the callings that God has put upon your life. That's right. And those are what you're going to be held accountable for. What did you do with them? And so uh, after the rapture takes place during at the time of the I mean the end of the tribulation. Jesus is going to come back, and we're going to come back with him. That's right. As a triumph force. And he's going to set up an earthly kingdom here in Jerusalem at the temple, and he will rule for a thousand years, is what we call the thousand year millennial reign of Christ. And. There will be people that will be born again during this time. There will be people that will be born. But we who come back with him will rule and reign with him. So, you know, what you do with your time here on this earth is going to have a lot to do with the job that you're going to be given during the time of the millennium. So, I want to... Tell y'all, you got anything else you want to add to this? No. Nothing? Not anything. Unless we want to remind the people about what it means to be born again, if you want to. I Go mean, ahead. Give me an opportunity. Well, to be born again, first of all, you've got to realize that, you know, we were talking, that's what we talked about earlier, about, about the, the sin, the sin mm -hmm. in the world. So you, you realize that. Jesus says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So first of all, we'll ask, ask, ask Father in the name of Jesus. We always pray to the Father in the name of Jesus the Christ to forgive us of our of, of our sins. And then after after that, they all you, that's all you do. You are you don't have to have any feelings or anything. You just know that you are forgiven. And then you just then you ask ask Jesus. I ask. God to come come into your heart. You ask Him to, for you to, to be born again, and how you do that is you you tell you tell God that you de definitely believe that Jesus is the Son of the, His Son, and that He did die on the cross for you, and that He did all the things we were we were talking about today. He died and He rose again from the from the dead, and then and that's that's all God is asking you to do, to believe that Jesus is his son, to be born again. And then you ask him to let me live live in me. And then you say, I was gonna make, I'll make you Lord, my Lord and Savior. Um, I just kind of got off track one minute and the Lord reminded me, uh, or the Holy Spirit reminded me. I want to go back to one thought here. Uh, the person asked, why do bad things happen to good people? When Satan is the ruler of this earth, he is still has a lease here. He is still the God of this earth, okay? He has certain rights. There are principalities and there are demons and there are authorities and principalities in heavenly places that uh, uh, dominate and rule in certain areas and over people. 
That's so right. as Christians, Jesus came to set us free from the dominion of Satan, take us out of his kingdom and bring us into God's kingdom. But he didn't take us out of here because he wanted us to witness and preach to others to bring others into the kingdom of God. Right. And so we have to use the authority and we have to use the word of God and our faith to do what God has called us to do. And we will be triumphant over Satan. Yes, and amen. Thank you very much. And the next time we get together, when we're talking about the gifts of the Spirit. Amen.